Most of my blacksmith tools came to me in one fell swoop from a, na a man named Bill Vian. I'll tell you about Bill one of these days. But he got the tools from a railroad roundhouse blacksmith shop. Now what I understand about railroad roundhouses were that they were the maintenance facility for railroad engines. And in order to be able to direct the engines into different service bays, there was a giant turntable. And the, the engine would come off of its track onto this turntable, and then it could be turned to point into whichever one of the service bays were going to be used to do the work that needed to be done. Now, I don't know enough about railroads to even talk to you about that, but I've tried to understand where my stuff came from. I got over 400 pieces from Bill out of that trove. And two of the pieces that I got were these things. Now, that's funny looking, isn't it? Obviously a hammer. Obviously a sledgehammer but pretty obviously not for blacksmithing. Compare those to these other hammers, which you may recognize. So that is a cross peen, a weight forward cross peen, kind of a dog hammer configuration where the preponderance of the weight is ahead of the eye unless you're using the cross peen. That's a striking hammer for blacksmithing. Here's a grown up version of the same thing, not quite as weight forward. I don't know if that's 16 pounds or 20 pounds, but that's a serious hammer. People have used this <laughs> to test punches. Probably they've used it for an anvil. But good hammer, another big cross pain. Ever seen a hammer like that? I got this from Dale Nelson. This is a post driving hammer. If that's on a handle, you can drive a small fence post, maybe a grape stake or big wide flat face that won't tend to split the edges off your post or create a depression that the rainwater can sit in. Somebody's used this for an anvil. Out of that same trove of blacksmith gear, I probably got 40 of these things. I think that these are hammer blanks. This is high carbon steel. It sparks high carbon. That's probably about the right size to make a 12 pound hammer. That's the right size to make an eight pound hammer. And I think that this hammer and this hammer were forged right there in that railroad roundhouse, specifically for use on the railroad. The railroad spike embeds in the tie at the edge of the track and the long side of the head captures the edge of the track. A hammer like this would reach over the top of the track and drive that spike home. You see that? The handle would be clearing the top of the track by a comfortable margin. So a man could stand on this side of the track and hammer the spikes on that side. And another guy could be standing on this side of the track, on this side of the track, hammering the spikes on this side. Which makes these just a fascinating artifact out of that gear that Bill gave me. Can you see how that eye is a little bit off center? That was forged in the shop. This one, now I don't know. <laughs> May have just been a better smith or he could have been having a better day, but that is slightly rotated. It's got 10 stamped on it. Oh, it also has a maker mark. This is a factory unit. Let me wire brush that. Let's see who made this thing. You see that? I don't know. That looks like a... I don't know. But probably that was made in a more commercial installation someplace. I don't know why I get such a kick out of this stuff, but can you visualize <laughs> I don't know, 50 or 60 miles of this track or five or 600 miles of it, two of them, out on a, just a blistering hot summer day. And probably you've got guys going ahead with single jacks starting these. So the nails are just sitting there, spikes are just sitting there ready to go. And probably you've got a man on one side of the track and a man on the other, and they are nailing those down until you could just puke. So I've always loved the stories of the American West. And I used to read about, you know, driving the golden spike, you know, spanning the, car, the continent with the railroad line. Of course, I was, I was more enchanted with the fur trade and the guys that were there 40 years before that. But just think of the project that that was, to bring the millions of railroad ties that it would take, to transport the tons and tons and tons of track and the blasting and the grading and the surveying. So just picture that. You got a surveying crew running out there into wild country. You have a crew coming along behind drilling and blasting 
and then men and horses with Fresnos and picks and shovels and more dynamite, moving the rock and grading and cutting the slopes and, and then placing the ballast. There would have to be some sort of, now it's ballast, the gravel, but whatever I assume was in the neighborhood that could be used to make the, the grade cutting those grades up miles of mountains and down the other side and then would come along the men putting the ties in place and then the track and then spike it down and somewhere right at the end of the track were the supplies, the cars, the wagons, the horses, <laughs> the hospital cars, I mean the rail cars that would take the casualties back or not. But in any case, gotta love these hammers, gotta love the real or imagined history that are associated with them. Gotta love the evidence of hard work that is so printed all over these things just by their existence. 